This is StoryBeat, Storytellers on Storytelling, an exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, Pittsburgh native Tamara Tooney, has had a storied career as an award-winning actor, director, and producer whose body of work has garnered international acclaim while simultaneously bringing light to important social issues. Tamara first came to national prominence as Jessica Griffin in As the World Turns. She then gained an international following playing medical examiner Dr. Melinda Warner on the legendary NBC series Law & Order SVU. Currently, she can be seen starring opposite John Goodman and Michaela Cole in the BBC Netflix thriller Black Earth Rising as Eunice Clayton, Assistant Director of African Affairs. Recently, Tamara wowed audiences in the hit AMC series Dietland, in which she stars as Julia, manager of the beauty closet, an underground warehouse full of every kind of beauty product imaginable, which is at the heart of a mysterious plot. Tamara was a series regular on Sundance TV's The Red Road as tribal chief Marie Vanderveen, opposite Jason Momoa and Julianne Nicholson. Recurring guest starring roles have included such hit shows as Better Call Saul, Blue Bloods, Billions, Alpha House, 24, Elementary, and Survivor's Remorse. Tamara starred in the Netflix film Irreplaceable You with Gugu Mbatha Raw and Mikiel Huisman, Flight with Denzel Washington, The Devil's Advocate opposite Al Pacino and Charlize Theron, City Hall, also with Al Pacino, Snake Eyes with Nicolas Cage and Gary Sinise, and The Caveman's Valentine, opposite Samuel L. Jackson. She made her feature film directorial debut with the indie romantic comedy See You in September, starring Estella Warren and Justin Kirk. On Broadway, Tamara produced the hit show Spring Awakening, which won both the 2007 Tony Award for Best Musical and the Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Musical. She also produced the plays Magic Bird and August Wilson's Radio Golf, which was nominated in 2007 for both the Tony and Drama Desk Awards for Best Play. And she produced Frog Kiss, the musical, a reimagined bedtime story with a body twist at Virginia Stage Company. Tamara starred in Tony Award-winning playwright Robert Schenken's two-person political suspense thriller Building the Wall with James Badge Dale at New World Stages. She also realized the role of Marvelous in Denai Gurira's Familiar, for which she won an Obie. She brought Kendra to life in the Barrington Stage Company's world premiere production of American Son, and she portrayed the lead detective in Steven Soderbergh's The Library at the Public Theater. She starred as Maggie in the first all-African-American production of Tennessee Williams' Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Calpurnia in Julius Caesar opposite Denzel Washington, and the 20th anniversary post-9-11 benefit concert of Dreamgirls. She also shared the Broadway stage with the late, great, legendary Lena Horne in the musical Lena Horne, The Lady and Her Music. Beyond acting, producing, and directing, Tamara is deeply engaged in several community and philanthropic efforts. She served as chair emerita of the board of directors of Figure Skating in Harlem, a nonprofit organization that teaches education and life skills to young girls through the art and discipline of figure skating. She's also president of the board of directors at Harlem Stage, The Gatehouse, a board member of God's Love We Deliver, and she serves on the advisory board of Hearts of Gold. So for all of those incredible reasons, and so many more, it is a truly great honor for me to have the extraordinary Renaissance powerhouse, better known as Tamara Tooney, 
as my guest on Story Beat today. Tomorrow, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Steve. So I'm worn out. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I want to lay down after reading, after you read all of that. I'm like, ooh, I'm exhausted. My first question is, is when do you find time to sleep? I know, really. Actually, um, I was uh, on KDKA this morning, on mm. PTL this morning, bright and early. And when we finished that interview, I went back to my apartment and I got back into my pajamas and I went back to sleep before I came over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you had a little bit of rest. Yes, I grab sleep when I can. Oh, well, cool. Okay, so let's go back to your roots. Where did this all begin? When did you first get the taste for being an a actor, an actress, however you want to call it? When did you? When did this first happen for you? I, you know, I think I have to attribute it to, to, to grade school, actually. Um, you know, I went to Homestead Elementary School, and um, the arts were a big part of... Um, of the curriculum there. And I remember um, our, our principal, Miss McGeever, you know, a lot of people ask me how how come I can remember so many lines. No kidding. And, you know, the whole memory thing. And I attributed a lot to Miss McGeever because when we were in grade school, every year at the beginning of the year, we would get distributed poems. All the classes would get distributed poems. Um, and the poems were, you know, uh, relative to whatever grade you were in. If you were in first grade, you know, they were simpler. If you were in sixth grade, they were a little longer, a little mm -hmm. more complicated. And you'd get this booklet at the end of the year, and you would have to memorize and recite these poems um, to your teacher. How many? It would depend on the class. Okay. You know, I think if you were in first grade, it might have been maybe, I don't know, maybe six poems or ten poems. And if you were in the um, in sixth grade or so, you know, there might have been maybe 15 or 20. And you had to have all of them memorized. And you'd memorize them, you know, one by one throughout the year so that by the end of the year, the spring and May, there would be an event, uh, an excursion. And if you completed all your poems, which you would get a stamp on when you uh, recited them to your teacher, if you completed them, then you could go on the field trip. And so I think so there that was a started, reward for it. Always a reward. <laughs> okay. Always a reward. So I think that was the beginning, at least, of um, my power of memorization. Um, was it easy for you? Yes, it was. It was. So you had a facility for it where uh, some yes. people don't. I did. I did. And um, and uh, and also, you know, in grade school, I was in school plays. I remember my first play was Rumpelstiltskin. And the what did prince. You, what did, did you play the who? Who did? No, did you play? no, no. The prince in Rumpelstiltskin apparently had three sisters, and in this production of Rumpelstiltskin, okay. and I was one of the sisters, so I was a supporting player. <laughs> oh, you got your start as a supporting. <laughs> yes, player. Yes, indeed. There are no small parts. But you spun it into gold anyway. <laughs> I spun it into gold. <laughs> indeed. Yes. Uh, okay. So, so about how old was this? How old? Oh, were you? that was third grade. Third grade. So you third were about grade seven, was eight my years first old, play. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there. Okay. Yes. So, so. Uh, um, at what point did you think to yourself, maybe I'd like to do this? Were you watching TV and movies and thinking, I want to do that? No, actually, I'm all through school. Uh, I, I my goal was to become a doctor and a uh, pediatrician to well, be. Well, you did it. Didn't I you? know, right? I'm not, <laughs> but I play one on TV. Yes, indeed. Um, so, so all my um, academics were geared toward, you know, the maths and sciences all the way up until my senior year of high school. And, you know, I had taken dance classes and I had um, done school plays, like I said. I was in my church choir. I was in the cho chorus at school. And um, every spring we would do, you know, a spring recital and I would have a solo and it was from some musical show. And so it was my senior year that I thought, you know what, I've been singing and dancing and acting since I was little. Mm -hmm. And... It brings people pleasure and joy, and so and it brought you pleasure and joy. Oh, absolutely! And and um, Dr. Thomas Caruso was our choir director and music teacher at Steel Valley High School, and he was an alum of Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. And so um, I approached him and said, "I, you know, I think I want to do this." And you know, what schools do you think? And he said, "Well, CMU, of course." Of course. And so, so he did not help me in any way. To get into the school, he only suggested that I audition. And I was going to audition for the drama program, for the acting program, right. which was there. But the criteria, I was just telling Lori Clatcher this the other day, who also is a Carnegie Mellon yes. alum, who's in the play with me, the roommate the at roommate. City. Yes, and we've known each other since that long. Wow. But I was telling her, you know, when I auditioned um, for CMU, I wanted to to study acting. I mean, that's what I wanted. 
Um, but the criteria for the acting program required mime and some other things that I found intimidating. And the musical theater program was only a year old at CMU. And it asked <laughs> for singing, dancing, and a monologue and acting. And I felt like those I could do. So I, you know, got into my family station wagon. Were and, you singing as a little girl? Yes. Yeah, I was in the choir. So you were always singing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I drove myself down to uh, CMU. Um, to audition and um, really not knowing what what I was getting myself into. Uh, and so when I got there, you know, there were kids from like, you know, Interlochen and, you know, performing arts high schools and stuff mm-hmm. auditioning. And, you know, and I, um, I they had resumes and, and some of them had been performers already professionally. And and so, you know, they they um, they had a piece of paper where you filled out your name and your address and and, you know, your resume, some of the work that you had done. And I really had not much to put on that piece of paper, <laughs> but um, I auditioned. But um, you had your talent. I sang and I danced and I did my monologue and I was accepted into the program. And that fall, when I arrived at CMU, uh, Jerry Dantry, and if you're listening, Jerry, I'm talking about you. <laughs> Jerry Dantry, who played piano for the dance classes, for the mu- uh, the dance classes, and also for the musicals mm-hmm. at CMU. When I got there, he pulled me aside and he said, "I just want you to know, Paul Draper." wept at your dance audition. Wow. And Paul Draper was the dance teacher at the school at the time, sure. who was legendary in his own right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that was a vote of confidence. Well, well, I would say it would be <laughs> if you get somebody who knows what they're doing to tell you, you know what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, it was really great. So what did CM do do for you? What What did you take away from CMU? Everything? Everything. Everything. I mean, really. I mean, um, you know, n- not my basic ability. Um, well, of course. Right. But uh, we, as a teacher, we can't teach talent. Right. We can enhance talent. Yes. We exactly. can make you better. And I felt like that's what what I um, achieved at CMU. That's what I left with. Um it was very uh, a very rigorous program. The musical theater program actually offered pretty much the exact same acting classes. As the acting program did. Interesting. Yes. So I felt like I actually made the better choice because I pretty much had a double major Mm -hmm. of acting and music and dance, triple major. Um, And so I felt like I was really, when I left CMU, I was really equipped to go to New York and find work. Uh, not just as an actor, but also as a dancer, also as a singer. And so I think it gave me a lot more opportunities once I left CMU. Well, certainly that's the reputation for a very long time about yes, CMU. Yes. So you are you are incredibly fortunate that you went through that program. Exactly. Uh, not to toot our own horn, but we've got a pretty good drama and dance program here at Point Park, too. Well, here's what I did not, here's what I did not um, say. In the summers when CMU was... You know, close when sure. classes were over. I took dance class here at Point Park there you during go. the summer. Absolutely, they, ha- they have an international reputation here for dance. That's and, right. And so, uh, you know, CMU is is obviously CMU, but yeah. Point Park is up in there. I know. I'm very impressed it, with what's it, Point Park University. It really is extraordinary yeah. that, that we're up in there. Because <laughs> when because when we were kids, because mm-hmm. we're not terribly different in age. Uh-huh. Um, when we were kids, it was Point Park College. College, that's right. It was more or less a secretarial school. Yes. And had a little bit of these other things. Right, right. And now it's and really... And look, yeah, it, look at it now. That's correct. Okay, so uh, obviously you've been at this now for quite some time. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, at what point, was it during CMU, before CMU, or sometime after where you thought to yourself, I am actually pretty good at this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to actually have a career. When did you think that to yourself? Well, I I I thought that upon leaving Carnegie Mellon, you, you knew it I right did. away. Um, you know, and there was a level of discipline that I learned at CMU that I think is is critical to success. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, I felt like uh, when I moved to New York that this was going to be my career. Now, certainly when I got there, I had to get my survival job, <laughs> you know, and a lot of uh, actors wait tables, etc. Mm-hmm. I'm not cut out for that. But what I could do was type. So um, I learned typing in seventh grade <laughs> well enough to, you know, be able to uh, be a, um, a typist, what did you call it? Secretary. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, uh, a temp. 
a temp. Yeah, so I would sign up with a well, temp that's agency. That's the perfect a- job for someone in the business. Yeah, and um, and fortunately, the jobs that I would get assigned to, you know, I mean, it's New York City, so they know that there are a lot of people in the entertainment business who are there but are, you know, doing part-time work. And so everywhere I would work, um, they understood that if I had an audition, you know, they would work it out so of I course. could go and do it. And so it, it worked out great well, that way. And, and how long was it before you got your first gig? Oh, well, I got my first gig. Um, actually, I'd been in New York maybe a month or so. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, which is, you know, unusual, but it was great. But um, I arrived in New York in September, and they were actually auditioning for the um, Radio City Christmas Spectacular. Oh, really? Yes. And so um, I auditioned, and they have singers, you know, in the spectacular. It's not just the Rockettes. And um, so I was actually hired as a singer, but then I was offered another job, which was a production of Kiss Me Kate at um, a, a dinner theater in Connecticut. Okay. And I actually chose to do the Kiss Me Kate project over the Radio City really? project. Yeah, because it, it was a musical, and that's what I came to do. And it, it, and it was a, a lead, and it, it was acting and singing and dancing. And being paid. And being paid. All at the yeah, same time. yeah, yeah, of course. Well, Radio City pays well, too. I mean, well, no, I was in, we don't but want to But I'm saying you, wouldn't, you might not have taken it if they said you're coming up for three weeks and we're not giving you anything. Oh, no, well, that's out of the question. Right. I had to pay my bills. Right. So, um, so, yeah, so I went up and did... Uh, Kiss Me Kate up in Connecticut mm-hmm. at this dinner theater. And so that was, you know, November, December um, upon my arrival to New York. And then, uh, fortunately, I would say, my tonsils abscessed during what? that production. What? <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> and I couldn't sing. No. No, it was pretty bad. And was it to scare the heck out of you? It was very scary because I was um I was alone in Connecticut, you know, in a hotel room mm-hmm. and my throat was closed, but I had gone to the doctor and actually they had to lance my tonsils, oh, which lovely. was not lovely. Uh but anyway, <laughs> so I couldn't swallow and so I was just taking antibiotics and Tylenol with codeine and sleeping, sleeping, sleeping. And I wasn't eating much. But I had a great friend who lived in Connecticut. Kid, and she came. She was my roommate here at CMU. And she came and rescued me from that hotel room and took me back to her, her mom's place. And they nursed me for uh, a week or so. Mm. And then I came back to New York. And so I went back to my temp job. And I was working at a company called Cooper's Libran. It's a finance company. Sure. And I was a... Um, you know, I was doing office work, and there happened to be a, a a gentleman, a young guy who worked there. His name was Greg Sneed. Okay. And Greg Sneed's father, Sherman Sneed, was the manager for Lena Horne. Oh. And at this time, Lena Horne was on Broadway doing her Broadway show, Lena Horne, The Lady and Her Music. Right. And it had been running for about a year, and some of the um, – she had background singers and dancers – And they were leaving, and so they were replacing the background singers and dancers. And so he said to me at my desk (laughs) in my office, you know, they're they're looking for replacements for Lena's show. You should have your agent look into it. And so I did, and so I auditioned for for the show, and I was hired. So let's take a half a step back for those that are are listeners out there. Mm -hmm. Um, How did you get the agent? Oh, wow. I arrived in New York City with an agent. Okay. Yeah, I left this part out. Well, I, um, it's an important part, isn't it, for those that are trying to get It's a very there. important part because while, while I was at CMU in the summers, not only was I taking dance classes occasionally at mm-hmm. Point Park, mm-hmm. but also I did Civic Light Opera. Uh-huh. So I did two seasons of Civic Light Opera, uh, one between my junior and senior year, and then one upon graduating. Um, and so I got my equity card. You know, with CLO. So you went to New York as a union member. Yes. So I had my union card with me. And also, CLO would hire um, their principal players from New York City. And so a lot of times, those uh, principal players' agents would come to see them in the shows. Mm -hmm. And so one of those agents came to see one of their clients and saw me in the chorus and gave me his card and said, you know, when you come to New York... Uh, look me up. You, you're you, you are what a friend of mine calls. You can fall through a barrel of corkscrews and not get scratched. You're gonna, you, <laughs> you are you are you have obviously you have the requisite skills and talents. That's the first part. 
But then beyond that, you also have had a bit of luck along the way, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have to have some of that. And it's a combination. It's a combination well, you, of it all. All the luck in the world is not going to keep you there if you have no skills and talents. That's correct. So you, you have to have that part And if you have no discipline and you don't know how to work with people. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So Would uh, you say that's a forte of yours, working with people? I think so. I think so. You know? You get along with pretty much everybody. I do. I do. I think that's a key. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason not to not get along. You uh, well, know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> but, but I'm going to guess, and no names needed, but I'm going to guess along the path you've met a few people who were less than agreeable. I have. Uh-huh. I have. And and so it's a good moment to ask the question, how how do you deal with somebody who's disagreeable? Again, no names are needed. Right. How, what what is your do you have a method for it? Um, I don't know that I have a method because I think every situation is different. Okay. Um, but you know, first of all, I, I th- my mama raised me right. You know what I mean? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> my mom and daddy raised me right. You know, and um, also I you know I don't think and I have never thought that anything productive really came from confrontation. Mm-hmm. I mean, confrontation in the negative way. Right. Um, uh, certainly, I think. Um, you know, there are always going to be uh, disagreements or different ways of seeing things. But I think there's also a way to articulate that. And I think there's a way to uh, be open enough to hear what somebody else has to say. I think you just said the key word. You have to he- hear and listen to what somebody's yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to shoving it all yeah. out. Yeah. And then, you know, work through it. You know? It's that simple. Work through it. I mean, because at the end of the day, it's relationships. Right. You know, and you have relationships with your fellow actors, you have relationships with your directors, you have relationships with your producers, you have relationships with your teachers, right. for those who are studying. I mean, there are relationships, you know, and there and there are relationships that, you know, can be really beneficial to you. And the business is predicated on it. Exactly. I mean, it's it's all about who you know. True. Not so much what you know or, and or also how you do it. And also your reputation Absolutely. in that business. Absolutely. Because a lot of people start and don't do whatever they do and get a bad reputation true. and they stop working and nobody wants to work with you that's right yeah and out the door you go and, yeah. you, and you may not even realize why. what happened yeah so yeah a lot of time people won't tell you I, I i teach my my students when they go out to hollywood who's the first person when you go for a job interview who's the first person you need to really pay attention to and they, they look at me like well who's that and I, and I say it's the guard at the gate that's right you have to be nice to the guard at the gate that's right and then the, you have to be nice to whoever the assistant is that's right and if you're not they will remember you absolutely and, so, and that assistant may be the producer in 10 years that's exactly especially you know in Hollywood I mean? especially so <laughs> especially so <laughs> sometimes the, the the PA is the one you're going to work that's for right. in 10 years that's right yeah absolutely right okay so let's talk about your what I guess is your longest gig which is SVU. Yeah. Yes. So how many years now? Well, I've I was on the show a total of 18 years really. Just a mere 18, 18 years. 18 years. Yes, but that was broken up into uh various incarnations if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, I started the show um really just to do come on and do one episode as the medical examiner. I hear this story all the time about uh folks who have um, gotten they became huge from something, but they started as one episode. Yeah, yeah, that started as one episode, and at that time, I, I uh, they wanted me to come in an audition, and I was doing a reading of something, mm-hmm. and I couldn't get to the audition, and at that time I had done. They they asked you to come in. Yeah. They asked me to come in and, through okay. my agent. So, so okay, so we, we'll, we'll, if I want to hear the story, and then yeah. I want to know is how did they hear about you? Well, this is part of the story. Okay, good. Um, at this point, I had already done an episode of the original Law & Order. I had done a couple of episodes of New York Undercover. I had done an episode of Feds. I had done an episode of Swift Justice. Got These it. were all Dick Wolf shows. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> These are all Dick Wolf shows. And you made friends. Well, yes, but um, but each show is different. You know, it's a different sure, family sure. on each show. Um, but with one person in the middle being Dick Wolf. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, Dick Wolf's decisions really are on, like, the... Um, the lead players. He does. He's not really involved in the day to day casting. But, but he would have seen you. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so I couldn't get to the audition. So I said to my agent, you know, I've done every Dick Wolf show that's been on television. I think they kind of know what I do. Um, 
You know, either they want me or they don't, you right. know. Sure. Laughingly. Mm -hmm. Well, the next day she called and she was like, okay, so you have the part, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so what happened was when I went to work that day, Ted Kotcheff, who was the executive producer on Law & Order SVU, uh -huh. I met him. And also, he, also a motion picture director. He's a brilliant motion picture, picture director. Mm -hmm. And so Ted said... Um, you know, upon meeting, he welcomed me to the show, and he said, you know, I'm a big fan of yours, you know, I love Devil's Advocate, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was just like, oh, okay, okay. And I, he was like, so welcome, you know what I mean? So I had a body of work that, uh, you know, predicated my being on SVU. Good. And so at the time they said, you know, this is one episode, it might recur, um, you know, we'll see. So I started doing that show, and it did. Rec I, I did become a recurring character, sure. and then I became a regular recurring character, and then I became a series regular for several seasons, and then I became a recurring regular again, <laughs> and then I became a recurring again, <laughs> and then last year, season nineteen, I did one episode. <laughs> so, so. so it's kind of like this big arc you did. It, it's a total from arc. one to one. From one to one. Wow. Yeah, yeah, from one but to one. But meantime, you got 18 years of stuff out of it. Oh, but meantime, I was also doing, uh, you know, multitasking on other shows and in theater at the same time. Sure you were. And, and that was the you, same. You couldn't have this very, very long resume without yeah. that. And that was, the, you know, I, I'll tell you, though, but the soap opera set me up for that. When I was doing As the World Turns. That's the, that was before SVU. That was before SVU. But then it became at the same time as SVU. So okay, we'll talk Which about is another story. Let's, let's talk about that. That's for a moment because you you did that recently here, where you were in the Tempest while you were rehearsing the roommate. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now you're saying you were in As the World Turns and SVU at the same time, and doing Julius Caesar on Broadway. Is that all? That's that was all at the moment. <laughs> okay. With an so, occasional voiceover thrown in. <laughs> oh my lord. So 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 explain to us yeah. how you manage that. Yeah. Well, here's here's um. How do you manage here's, all the different lines in your head? Yeah, here's what I, I wanted to to say and predicate that. When I joined the cast of As the World Turns, mm -hmm. um, right before I, I came to that show, you know, I had been doing musicals in New York for a good six years, and only musicals. And I was... M mostly Broadway, uh, off-Broadway? Broadway, off-Broadway, off regional theater. Got it. Musicals. Got it. And... You know, as I said, I wanted to be an actor when I went to Carnegie Mellon. Right. And so when I was there, I had the actor training that the actors had. So I was a classically trained actor. And so I wanted to do more theater, straight plays. I wanted to do film and television. I hadn't cracked that nut at all. And uh, so I was doing Lost in the Stars up at the Long Wharf Theater in Connecticut. Beautiful production. And while I was there, I said to myself, this is the last musical I'm going to do. Really? Yeah. I said, I, and at the time... You, you determined it or you just knew it? I determined it. So you made a decision. I decided. Okay. That's, I decided. That's important. Yeah, I decided. And, um, and also at that time, I was changing agents. Uh, the agent I was working with, who I had come to New York with, who was wonderful, uh, was a predominantly musical theater agent. And I needed somebody who was going to get me indoors for uh, plays and 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 um, film and TV. Mm -hmm. And so there was an agency that was interested in representing me. So um, I had the hard conversation with the first agent, and it was difficult, and he was not happy. But as I always believe, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And so I Great very philosophy. respectfully told him, you know, this is what I think, and this is what I'm feeling, and this is business. And, you know, I love you as a friend, but this is business and this is what I think I need to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I changed agents and I and and I uh, I actually had to when I ironically, when I made that decision, I was still auditioning while I was performing at the Long Wharf and I auditioned for this little independent film called Sweet Lorraine. And. I got that film. And it was right after I said, this is going to be my last musical. Mm. And so I got hired for the film. And so I had to leave the musical a week or so early. And so that was another difficult conversation I had to have with the people at the Long Wharf to say, you know, I got this film and I'm going. And of course, they weren't happy either. Sure. But I said, but I know the actor who can fill in for me. 
She's my same size. She's brilliant. She's from Carnegie Mellon. And so plugged her in. And so I went off to do this film. And then not long after that, um, I auditioned for As the World Turns and got that job. And while I was on that show, the contract said, oh, and this was another situation where I went in to to be um, a recurring character. Okay. But after the first two weeks, they put a contract in front of me. Sure. And the contract said that for the first six months, you could not do any other job. You had to just do the soap. Okay. Well, three months into the contract, I got the film Wall Street. And so I went to my executive producer and head writer, Robert Calhoun and Doug Marlin, respectively. And I say that because I love them both. Mm -hmm. God rest their souls, because both of them were from the theater. And when I went to them at this three month point and said, I got this movie, Oliver Stone, Michael Douglas, et cetera. Pretty hard to pass up. Uh, they said, oh, no problem. We'll just write you. We'll just write around you. Don't worry. We'll just write around you. And at that time, Larry Brigman, who is an extraordinary actor. Yeah, sure. He was on As the World Turns as well. And Larry Brigman was also doing movies. He was doing Broadway. And I looked at him and I said, I want to do what he's doing. Because he had been on the soap for a long time, but yet he had this other you know, multifaceted career. Mm -hmm. And so I set myself up to follow in his footsteps. And because I had Doug Marlin and Bob Calhoun there supporting whatever it is I wanted to do, for the first eight years I was on that show, I was doing Broadway, I was doing film, I was doing uh, primetime television, I was flying out to L.A. to do NYPD Blue, mm -hmm. and flying back, taking the red eye back, and going to work, you know. But, I mean, but I was willing to do the work, you know. I was willing to sacrifice some sleep or whatever, and I was always prepared and ready, and I never cost production anything. And that's, so I that's think, a key too. Yeah, and I think that kind of set up, you know, the path that my career took from there. So for the listeners, let's let's uh, review that for just one moment. It's very important that you pay attention to the others and what they're doing because I'm going to ask you a question or two in the moment in, in a moment about what you have learned from other actors. Well, you've learned something from Larry Brigman, obviously, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he he managed to have a a, a bigger than one dimensional career absolutely and that's what you've had obviously yes you've yes. had a multi-dimensional career it goes way beyond acting which mm -hmm. we'll get to so shortly too mm -hmm. so so do, tell us about the audition process um uh when you are auditioning whenever that is yeah. do you have a, a method of routine a, a way that you set yourself up for it is there something that you do well it depends on the project you know, um, each one is unique. Each one is unique. I, I mean, when I'm auditioning for a play, it's kind of I'm auditioning for a play. But if I'm auditioning for a television show, particularly one that's already been running, I watch the television show and I see what they're doing. Looking I see what tone. the actors are doing and see what the tone is. Yeah. And I really discovered that when I did NYPD Blue. And I really discovered I mean, because there was a different tone on that show. It was the first time that I think on television that people were talking like this. Very. It was very, you know, you know, because David Caruso was very <laughs> brooding and quiet and everything. And that's what everybody was doing. And I was like, oh, I see. Okay. They weren't acting. Right. I was like, let me try that, you know. So, yeah, so that's kind of what it is. But here's what I will tell you that I discovered through my years of auditioning, which I found, you know, auditioning, uh, most actors, you know, get very trepidatious about it and anxious about it and, you know, uh, aim to please. And what I learned was the person that I need to please is myself. Interesting. Um, I don't know what the people on the other side of the table are thinking. I don't know what they're looking for. Sometimes they don't know what they're looking for. Right. You know, so um, I decided that I was going to start auditioning for myself and in my preparation, you know, figure out, you know, uh, you know, what what um, what story I want to tell in this scene, you know, what marks I want to hit in the scene, what beats I want to hit in the scene, um, what emotional journey I want in the scene. And if I go in the room and accomplish that, then I can walk out of the room feeling good and not wondering 
you know, because you, you will have done your best for you. And that's exactly. all you that's all you really can do. And that's really our job as actors. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then also I learned to look at auditioning as a, an opportunity to act, you know. Because that's, that's what we want to do. That's interesting. You, so you just look at it as another part of acting. Another and part a gig. of acting and another part of the gig. And then treat it as the gig. You know what I mean? Wow. But still be open enough and flexible enough to take direction. So are you then coming in philosophically as if it's it's just like any other job? It's not an audition, it's a job. Yeah, pretty much. And also a time to play. I look at it as a time to play. Do you find that, that the frequently those on the other side of the table are allowing you that play? Um, yes. Are they playing with you? They're playing with you. So there and you I go. think it's because I come in have with some choices made, mm -hmm. you know, and strong choices. Mm -hmm. You know, and I also think, you know, well, what is the most interesting choice I can make right here? In this moment. It is not playing it safe or down the middle. No, no. It's looking for choices. It's looking for choices and, and being bold. Would you say over all the years that you've been doing this that you've become better at picking those choices? Yes. Making choices? Yeah. And I think it comes with experience, too. You know, because I think you learn to be fearless. I don't think you start being fearless. <laughs> uh, unless maybe you're a bit of a sociopath. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, you know, so, yeah. So, and also to trust yourself. I, You know, I've, I've learned to trust myself You've a bit. You've matured into trusting yourself. You totally. Didn't, you started out, you were full of self-doubt to a certain extent. Of course, who isn't at 22 years you're, old? You're unproven. Right. You don't know whether you really can do right. this or and not. And also, you don't know. Let's just start there. You don't. You don't yeah, know. When right. I left CMU, I knew some things, but I didn't know everything. Well, you'd had a pretty good education. Yeah, but I didn't know everything. Oh, of course and when not. I got to New York, I went back into acting classes. I'm going to guess that you're still learning things. Yes. It hasn't, you haven't stopped learning. Never, never, never. I think when you do, you're done. Exactly. And, and, and with these two productions, with The Tempest and with The Roommate, you know, I'm always walking away going, okay, what did I learn from that experience? What am I, what am I taking away? And those are two completely different experiences. And from each one, I'm taking something different. Well, I've seen The Tempest. I'm going to see The Roommate in a couple of days. So I'm really looking forward to seeing, because the reviews have all said how different you are from one to the other. Right. Thank you. And that's all we're going to say about reviews. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't need to. I, I, we're not going to quote reviews at all. Do you, do you read your reviews? No, I don't. Okay, good. No, I don't. So all, all you need to know is that they, they definitely say you're not playing the same part. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I would imagine, would that be That would be good. It would be silly if you were. It would be crazy to see Prospero in the roommate. <laughs> yes, it would be. I, I can imagine it would be a very unusual thing. Okay, so what are your techniques for learning lines? Wow. Well, like I said, that muscle was developed early on. Um, but what, uh, one thing that I, I, have, um, I have developed in learning particularly monologues or long stretches of monologues, I write it down. You actually I write it. learn it by writing I it. I learn it by writing it. By hand? or By hand. And there's, there is a connection between there the mind and the, and the hand, isn't there? There absolutely that is. There isn't there when you're typing. And I'm telling you, with this Tempest production and with the monologues that Prospero has in the Tempest, literally one one evening after rehearsal, I sat down and I started and I wrote wrote down those monologues and I would say it as I write it, I say it as I write it, I say it as I write it, and by the time I get to the end of the monologue, I start saying the monologue and I pretty much have it in my brain. Really. Mm -hmm. Except with some you know some fine tuning, but I pretty much have it in my brain. You, you have. Close to a photographic memory, then. No, I don't. I, I, I went to CMU with a guy, Alex Bereznovich was his name, and he had a photographic memory. Just look at the page. He'd just look at it, and it would be in his brain. Wow. Now, I have, I have a few more R steps. Robert Mitchum allegedly had that, too. Did, really? He just looked at the page. And then I will throw this out. There's an app called Rehearsal Pro. Okay. Are you familiar no. with Rehearsal? No. The Rehearsal app created by an actor. <laughs> and basically, it's an app where you can download your scene or your sides or your script. And on the app, I have it on my iPad, you can highlight your lines. You can make notations, like with a pen thing. You know, there are all these little icons right. at the bottom. and But most importantly, you can record 
and you can record the other characters' lines and leave space for your lines so you can rehearse with yourself. Nice. And that is a game changer. That was brilliant. And I use it all the time. You don't need somebody else to read lines yeah, for you. Exactly. You know, no one to run lines. You can just do it wherever, whenever. You can do it wherever, whenever. While you're baking bread. Or riding on the subway or, to that sure. audition. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that is fantastic. And that's called Rehearsal Pro. Rehearsal Pro. I'm not looking to advertise for Rehearsal Pro. No, but, but I but, recommend it. But, but really good. Okay, so um, when you land a part and you, aside from reading the script, what's your process? What's the first thing that you start to do? How do you work the part? Well, usually when I read something, even before I audition for it, there usually is some kind of connection that I sense. feel about the character. You know, the sense that I have, what she, you know, might wear, what she, you know. That happens instantaneously. Yeah. If you don't get that, do you know it's not for you? Um I wouldn't say necessarily because sometimes it's a slower process, but okay. sometimes there's an immediate. I mean, like with The Devil's Advocate, the mm -hmm. film The De Devil's Advocate, I was like, yes, I know her. I know her. Got it right She's away. Me. Yeah, yeah. And I went after that part because I was like, this is me. This is mine, you know. Um, but 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 once I have the job and start, you know, I just kind of, I read the script, I read the script, I look for hints in the script about, you know, the character, I write down what I say about myself, I write down what other people say about me, um, you know, and, and, and then I just, you know, I like to discover, particularly with theater, um, I like to discover a lot through the rehearsal process. Right. You know, um, so often I just come in with a lot of questions. But you're starting with the facts of the script. What the are facts the facts of the script? And you're starting to write those down in order to know these are the facts you're dealing with. Right, right. And those are the only facts. Those you have are the to deal only with. facts. And then, you know, uh, through the rehearsal, you know, in early in rehearsal, I might write my own biography. So I start filling in some of the blanks, you know, and decide, you know, where was I born and how did I grow up mm -hmm. and, you know, get some history in there. You know, I look at the relationships to some of the other characters and I make up history with them, you know, and then I might talk to them about that history and what they think. And so to fill in, to fill in, to fill in, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then uh, I just allow the um, rehearsal process to really continue to inform me. And how important is the director in that process? Uh, very important. I incredibly important. Mm -hmm. But there have been times when I have um, had a director who wasn't necessarily helpful in that way. Okay. So I just had to do it myself. You know what I mean? So so I, I'm, I'm, I'll ask the obvious question that, that mm -hmm. people always talk about is that television directors tend to be a little bit more like traffic cops. Absolutely. Because they're in a big, it's a big hurry. Yeah. And motion picture directors tend to be a little bit more attentive to the actors. They are. That is absolutely true. And with television directors, a lot of times, particularly if it's a series, you know, they're coming in just to direct that episode. Mm -hmm. So they're trusting that the actor knows about their character. You should know your more character. More than they would. Sure. You know. Sure. And. And, especially, and, I, and especially the stars and the regulars. Yeah, and I think that's fair. You know, I think that's absolutely fair. And like you said, with film, you might have a little more time for the director to help you, um, you know, flush out the character a little bit more. Right. Um, when I did the film Flight, I was fortunate enough to be able to, uh, we shot it in Atlanta, and to go down there a few weeks before production and actually have some rehearsals mm. and, and, you know, read the script with Denzel and with John Goodman and with the writer and and with Robert Zemeckis and so we were all in the room together talking about it and figuring it out and, and it almost felt theatrical you mm -hmm. know it almost felt like you know a, a, a theater ensemble the one who was most famous for that was Sidney Lumet he oh yeah always rehearsed for two or three weeks and then they just went and shot it's such a joy mm -hmm. it's such a joy to be able to do that but that's not the case in, most times right that's not and the most case. times you know particularly if you're you know, a day player on a series or you have, um, you know, a few days on a movie, you have to show up ready and decided, you know. Right. Yeah. It, so if and well, and that's the opposite, which is Clint Eastwood, who doesn't rehearse at all and who comes in. And if you don't know your lines and your part, 
you're in big trouble because <laughs> he's going to do one take and you're done. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. And yet he gets brilliant performances out of people. So, Absolutely. So the, the different techniques. All right, so let's talk about directors for a moment. Mm -hmm. And that is, t t tell me, uh, and if you want to name names, please. If you mm -hmm. don't, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me some things that you've learned from directors that you yourself have then adopted that you continue to use. What have what if he, what's maybe the most important lesson you've ever learned from a director, if you can think of one? Hmm. I can I can I, I will only go back to Mark Wing Davy, who directed uh, Troyless and Cressida in Central Park mm. in in New York, in which I played Helen of Troy, and that was my first big Shakespeare show. That was my first, and 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 it was just one scene. Helen only really had one scene, but we did a lot of um, we did a lot of of research and and you know game playing and interesting things. And you know, I really can't say specifically one thing that I left that experience with with Mark Wing Davy, but what I left that experience with was a whole lot that I was able to take forward into my next real production of a Shakespeare play, which was Antony and Cleopatra, where I played Cleopatra. And well, what was it that you took with that you took away? I, you know, a whole I, lot. A whole lot. I don't know. Maybe it was just um, the sensibility of it. Maybe it was just an, uh, an, a knowledge that this is something that of course I can do, you know, so, so in other words, what you probably took away, what you're, I think you're saying, is you took away even more confidence than you had. More confidence, but also a a a, a technique of how to kind of tackle it as well. Was there something that he said to you that did that? You know, I really couldn't tell you. That was so long was ago. <laughs> it was so long ago. And but I just it, remember. Th I just remember how much I loved that experience. Mm -hmm. How much I felt. Um, I felt uh, a part of of Shakespeare. Uh, which I had not felt since college, you know, since having done something in college. And so, um, so yeah, so it kind of like, I don't know, maybe it just put my feet on solid ground as far as Shakespeare was concerned. Okay, and, and, you, and you've done lots of classics. It's, I have since then, yeah. 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 Uh, did you do them in college as well? Yeah, at CMU we did, you, you know, did. some Shakespeare's so and some was, Chekhov's. So it wasn't your first taste of it. No, no, no. But you, but you, but again, the classics tend to be a little scary to people. Yeah, but I wanted that. You know, that's one of the reasons I was like, no more musical theater. What, what have <laughs> you learned? What techniques have you learned from movie or TV directors about camera work? Mm, the camera work, I really. Um, oh well, here's I, this is perfect. So I just did the series Black Earth Rising, right? right? I shot in London with the brilliant Hugo Blick, who wrote and directed it. And ironically, I was working with a friend of mine in New York, who is a musical theater star, okay. Tony Award winner. Okay. But she hasn't really cracked that television film nut, you know. And she really wants to get in her. And she was like, I, I don't know, what am I doing? What am I doing? So anyway, so she was like, you know, would you coach me on these scenes? And actually, I coached her on a, uh, a several years ago on uh, a scene. Um, well, actually, okay, it was LaShawn's, and she was auditioning for The Color Purple, She's the original production. And so she was like, you know, would you read would read this with me? And coach? So we did, and so, of course, she got the part. The rest is history. So anyway, she's still, you know, we're still very close friends. So she came, and she was like, you know, I'm reading for this role, and, you know, would you read it with me? And so we did the scene and everything, and I watched her, and, and I said, okay, now do it one more time. I said, and don't blink. And she was like, what? I was like, don't blink. And she, I said... If you look at film and TV, mm -hmm. people don't blink, mm -hmm. you know? And she was like, wow, okay. So she went and she did the audition and she got called back, you know, three more times. She ultimately didn't get the job, but it was the closest she had ever gotten. And she was like, oh, got that. So this was a month before I went to London to don't do blink. Black Earth Rising. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing the scene uh, in, the, in, the, in the series where basically my character is telling finally, what happened, right? Right. And so I'm speaking to, like, Interpol, and it's video link, so I'm on camera talking. So they're watching me on a screen. I'm watching them on screen. So we rehearse it with a camera, and I do it, and it's a long monologue. And then Hugo comes in. He's like, that's terrific. Now, I just have one note. Don't blink. <laughs> 
And I was like, <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> I knew that, you know. So, yeah, so it's interesting because it is a different pra- technique. Practice what you preach. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. And what it does is, I, I, I think what it does is, uh, because I tell young actors all the time, you know, the difference between theater and working for the camera is, you know, the theater is, you know, the world is the entire stage. Mm -hmm. The audience is seeing the entire stage and you are sharing your, not just your voice, but your emotional energy to the back of the theater. And on camera, the world is the size of whatever that shot is. Exactly. So if it's your face, that is the entire world. Exactly. Right? And so, so when you're, when you're doing a scene or particularly an intense scene or, you know, and, and it, the camera is, and it's you and the camera, when you blink, it's almost like a shutter and it closes off the emotional connection. Right. But if you don't, the audience is allowed to go in through your eyes to your soul, mm. to what's going on. Mm. The, 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 the adage always is that the camera is seeing into you yeah. and it's pulling your soul out. Yes. And that the great stars, the truly great stars, the Denzels of the world, yes. the Al Pacinos, yes. their soul is just out there for the taking. Oh my God. I was just watching, you know, Godfather 2, like, <laughs> last night or the night before last and if I turn it on forget it I'm up till 2 o'clock in the morning <laughs> you know and just watching Pacino's performance and his eyes his eyes which can go from you know warm pools to just black soulless has there ever been a greater coiled snake on screen Ooh. Genius. I mean, he's always just ready to tripwire, and when that tripwire goes, get out of the way. I know. I'm like, Kate, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. You said it. (laughs) Do you? Do you? Have you ever seen the Michael Caine video on on technique? No. So he has a technique where he teaches people in this video about which eye to look at when. When wherever the camera is, ah, so yes. that he talks about if the camera is over on this side, yes, you you stare into that camera side eye and don't go back and forth. Sometimes That's you see right. actors flipping back and forth That's with their right. eyes. That's right, and that makes a big difference. It does. It absolutely does. Because that focus is everything. The focus is right there, and also you can see two eyes. <laughs> you can see two. You eyes. can see two eyes exactly. Yeah. All right. So, what what have you learned from any of the great or even maybe not so famous actors that you've worked with that you've continued to use that you took away as a trick or a tip mm, a trick or a tip. like what did you did you learn anything from al pacino or denzel or i i didn't learn anything from al but i learned that he was really funny is he he's really funny we had a great time on set great time on both those films and i and i i will treasure those moments always always and you know and also what i learned from al is that you know he likes to work and he finds joy in the work, you know. And so, you know, if you're going to, you know, let's do another take and let's do it different. Let's do another take and let's do it different. You know what I mean? And I love that. I love that. And so I always try to do something different with each take that I do. That also probably keeps you quite fresh. It does. It keeps it very fresh and it keeps it very present, mm-hmm. you know, and it keeps it also unpredictable. You know what I mean? And I love working with actors who can play. You know what I mean? It, so if are I'm you gonna, good with an actor th- trying to throw you for a loop? No, it's not Maybe about the wrong throw, term. Yeah, it's not about throwing for a loop. Th- that they're, that they're you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but they're giving you something that's a little different. A little different. I treasure it. I treasure it because that's how it stays fresh. Are there actors who are thrown by it? Yes. And so then they they get flustered. Or they shut down. Or they shut down. Or they shut down. But you thrive on it. I love it. I mean, you know, my friend Michael Hayden, who I did American Son up at Barrington Stage with, you know, who's one of the finest actors there are, you know, at one point, you know, we we had never worked together. And so when we came together, you're always kind of sussing out, you know, Mm -hmm. what your what your partner is like and how they work and, you know, how's how's this going to dance going to be. And so Michael and I realized from the beginning that we were, you know, in it you know heart and soul blood sweat and tears and we uh, on a break we were talking and he said you know i did uh i did um sweet bird of youth i think it was with elizabeth ashley and she and 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 they were just like uh, going at it you know and elizabeth ashley said to him you know acting is a blood sport and i was like yeah (laughs) yeah i like that it's a blood it's a blood sport you got to get in there you know well in 
seeing the tempest, yes, I saw that. Yes. It was a blood sport for you. It's a blood sport. And even with the clowns, it's a blood sport. You got to get in there and, you know, just I, I'm not so crazy about bloody clowns, but that's a whole that's a whole other story. <laughs> no, it's a different movie. Okay, so we've been at this for close to an hour now, mm. and um I'm going to ask you the last Famous, my famous last two questions. Okay. okay so um, you have clearly worked with tons of people. Can you give us, you've already told us a number of them, but do you have a particular story that's really quirky, weird, funny, offbeat, oddball, or just hilarious? Oh, wow. Other uh, than what you've already told I us. I don't, you know, I'm so bad at those kinds of things because uh, it's just all been fun. You know, it's just. What's the most fun you've ever had on a set? Oh, Wow. Or one of the most fun. The most fun was uh, the most fun was flight because I had to simulate that airplane crash, and to be in the cockpit, you know, strapped in and turned upside down. We called it the rotisserie, you know, because literally <laughs> they turned this cockpit upside down, um, you know. And that, I mean, that was great fun. It was really. They had you strapped in pretty well. I oh think. yeah, we were strapped in like. Um, you know, like fighter pilots, but it was great. It was so good. And did did it did no pain involved? Not not much. I mean, there was a little pain involved in the um, when we were shooting the cabin part where we were being like tossed around, you know, the plane like uh, you know really incredible turbulence, and I wasn't strapped in, and I was, so I had a couple of bruises, you know. But I called it my um, action movie moment. They're, so. they're sort of like you wear it like a badge of honor. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because <laughs> you've not done a ton of action movies. No, I haven't. Would and you I, like to do more? Of course I would. Yeah. Who doesn't want to do an action movie? It'd be so much fun. You could, you know. If you Anybody could emulate a career. It would be Samuel L. Jackson's career. Oh, Sam's who's done, done everything: drama, comedy, uh, straightforward stuff, and all these big action movies. Yeah, and the and the and the cartoon movies. Yes. You know, the, the uh, all of the the Marvel stuff. Exactly. Just and Star Wars on top of it. Yes. So I mean, he's, amazing. Yeah. Well, there's the career of careers. <laughs> Absolutely. And, really. Still, the, he's now the highest paid. When well, the highest paid, he's the highest box office actor ever. Excellent. Good like, for Sam. Like something like thirteen billion dollars. Beautiful. Of box office. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. <laughs> that is cool. Okay. Last question. Mm -hmm. You've given us tons of tips, but do you have for those who are just starting out in the business, or maybe those that are trying to get to that next level, do you have a good tip for them as to the way to conduct business? You know, I I just you know I just say the pre the three P's. Um, you know, preparedness. Uh, you know, uh, preparation. Um, persistence and perseverance. Those are my three P's. Say them again. They're preparation, preparation, persistence, per and, perseverance. and perseverance. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think if you have that, well, first of all, if you don't have those three, you're doomed. Right. And I think that applies to whatever line of work. I agree. You enter. That's true for virtually everything. That's right. It's true for being a writer. It's true for being a businessman or yep. a banker or a lawyer. All of those three. That's right. In character, when we develop character, one of the, the, the main elements is, is the notion of power, how much different power happens in scenes mm -hmm. and power between characters, mm -hmm. right? But the singular most important power of all the powers, and there are lots of them, is willpower. Okay, yes. Okay, so what would it be if you, the protagonist of your story, after the first three minutes of the story, said, I don't like this, I'm going home. <laughs> right, exactly. You have to have <laughs> willpower. That's Same right. Same thing in a career, isn't it? That's right. Absolutely. Well, clearly you've had more than your share of willpower. Well, thank you. This has been such a delight. It's such been a joy. my pleasure. Thank I'm you so, so much. I'm so glad you stopped by Storybeat today, and I thank you for coming in. Thank you, Steve. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.